Here's a question for you. Why don't you commit crime? Or maybe you do. In that case, why did you choose to go this way? These two questions are probably part of the cornerstone of every community. Because in order to truly function as a whole, we have to know what is permitted and what not. Joker, the somewhat controversial movie, also deals with these questions and gives us a bit of an explanation as to why someone might be attracted to criminal behavior. Joker asks us to look at the society, because we live in one. <laughs> in this movie, you have to take a look at success as proof of existence and well-being. The American dream, if you will. Simply put, not achieving the American dream can lead to criminal behavior. Robert Merton argues that someone might endure pressure to commit crime if you are unable to reach the shared goals of a society. Take Murray Franklin as an example. Presumably, he attained wealth and success by working hard. He pursued the cultural goals and did that with the means that were approved by society. Work and success will come. In the terminology of Robert Merton, he is the prime example of a conformist. Arthur Fleck is in a similar boat. He has a daytime job and aspires to be a comedian. The difference between him and Murray is that his goals are not as elusive as Murray's. Arthur is settling for less, therefore Merton would describe him as a ritualist. Both Franklin and Fleck are law-abiding citizens, but we see that Arthur has a clear disadvantage. His mental condition. Something that is not entirely accepted by his surroundings. Because of this, Arthur feels a persistent gap between who he is and who he should be to be fully accepted in the social landscape. He becomes part of the marginalized, and this means that Arthur needs to hide behind the mask. Joker portrays a constant duality between the sad and the happy clown, neither being a reflection of Arthur's authentic self, which leaves him in a traumatic and severe turmoil. This of course leaves him vulnerable, but Arthur finds more or less support in his daily activities. According to Travis Hirschi, we need to ask ourselves why someone doesn't commit crime instead of why someone does. This is the polar opposite of what Merton describes. Hirschi's theory is called the social control theory of delinquency. And in his words, these theories assume that delinquent acts result when an individual's bond to society is weak or broken. His theory is organized around four components. Attachment, commitment, involvement and beliefs. Depending on how secure these components are, the bond to society will be stronger. Let's start with attachment. Throughout the movie we see that Arthur has a compassionate mother and son relationship. He needs to take care of her but is also subject to her motherly control. <laughs> Thomas Wayne, thank you for coming in this morning. It's not funny. A prime example of commitment and involvement can be found in Arthur being passionate about clowns and making people laugh. Commitment is a rather rational component in conformity. Because he invests a lot of time in his job, the fear of losing that job withholds him of delinquent behavior. I love this job. In his free time, his aspiration of being a stand-up comedian becomes part of the involvement. Simply put, the less free time you have where you're not doing something, the less time you have for deviancy. And then we still have the beliefs. These are the shared norms and values. If you agree that, for instance, stealing is wrong, you will be less likely to steal. But it's also the faith you have in the world. And it's in this last part where Arthur's beliefs are crumbling. You don't listen, do you? Like I said before, he is part of the marginalized because of his mental condition. This is the cause for troubling situations, which in turn affects his view on society negatively. I don't think you ever really hear me. If this were the only problem, however, I'd say it would be less likely for Arthur to stray away. But there's an important moment that caused the snowball effect. The gang that attacked Arthur in the beginning of the movie. This led to Randall giving him a gun. The gun then falls on the floor in the appearance of a group of children and then Randall lied to the management about him being the actual owner of the gun. Besides, Randall told me you tried to buy a 38 off him last week. Which in result leads to Arthur losing his job. Is this enough to be a full-time criminal? No. But it's part of the growing frustration Arthur is feeling, which leads to a weaker bond to society, but also aggressive behavior. This means that he has an incredibly weak link to the commitment component and the beliefs component was already crumbling. And then there's the train scene. 
did Archer deliberately shot those three guys? I don't think so. He acted on an impulse, as you can see in his reaction after he shot the third guy. The reason he shot them is simply because there was a gun available. In 1967, Berkowitz and Lapage described the weapon effect, an event that refers to an increase in aggressive behavior when there is a presence of a weapon, especially when a person is already aroused. I should note that this is more of a hypothesis because later studies found it hard to replicate this effect, but I do think it's food for thought. So Arthur killed three men, but instead of showing regret in doing the right thing by going to the police, he falls into a stream of decay fueled by a couple of very important elements. First of all, the funding for the social service program gets cut, resulting in a loss of medication. This is the last time we'll be meeting. They don't give a shit about people like you, Arthur. Secondly, there's the conflict between Thomas Wayne and his anti-poor sentiment, and the lower class that made a symbol of Arthur's clown costume. Those of us who have made something of our lives will always look at those who haven't. It's nothing but clowns. Thomas Wayne! That's what this whole thing is about! And lastly, there's of course Murray, who jokes about Arthur's performance. Well, no one's laughing now. You can say that again, pal. Going back to Travis Hershey and his social control theory, we see that Arthur's bonds with society are collapsing. He's also replacing shared values and norms with his own. What once was unacceptable becomes the new standard because he sees a form of humor in it. He sees violence as something inherently funny. I forgot to punch out. Arthur also finds support in the protests that are raging through Gotham. The ones in the riots find a way to tear away from society by accepting the goals and means Arthur was using. This in turn gives Arthur the impression that what he did is allowed and that he will be rewarded with the recognition he craves so much. The only thing that keeps Arthur sort of in touch is the connection with his mother. But then he discovers that his life was built on a lie. Because you were adopted and I never slept with your mother. What do you want, what do you want, want from me? Money? And the last bond is also destroyed. The context of both the past and the future of Arthur's life disappears and the only thing he needs to do to set himself free is to cut ties with his mother. According to Hirschi, once the ties with society are broken or dismembered, the path to delinquency is completely open. Arthur is now in a state where delinquent behavior becomes the norm. If we go back to Robert Merton, we can put Arthur in a new category, the rebellion. This is the most extreme form of deviance in Merton's classification. This means that Arthur rejects the culturally accepted goals and means and replaces those with his own unwanted and criminal ones. Inspiring hundreds of others, the clown becomes a symbol as well as a form of authority. In Max Weber's classification of authority, we see a shift from rational legal domination to charismatic authority. The first one being a collection of the rational social constructs like the police and the government and so on, while the charismatic authority comes from the exceptional sanctity, heroism or exemplary character of an individual person. The citizens of Gotham once obeyed a legal office, but with the rise of Arthur, a group of people found the personal charm and strength of the Joker persona so attractive that they legalized its authority. They believe in the message of the Joker. They agree with the methods and values and they find solace in the idea that one day they will overthrow the rich. The Joker is born and legitimized. Arthur had the chance to build a new and criminal identity. This happens both by circumstantial events as well as his own actions. But maybe sometimes all it takes is just one bad day. 